Now, my story is a little bit strange because I come from, like you heard, I, 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 you know, if you were to describe me, you'd describe me as an Israeli. I was born and raised there. My father was a general. I come from this very patriotic family. Um, today, when I talk about that country, I refuse to call it Israel. I think it should be called Palestine. And when I say this, then, you know, people, people are often shocked because it, 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 it represents a very one-sided perspective. And having gone through this process that I describe in my book of, as a journey of an Israeli into Palestine, I've reached the, just, uh, the, I've reached a conclusion without any, any doubt at all in my mind that calling that country Israel is wrong. And we must all embrace uh, the fact that it's Palestine. Um, now, the journey that I uh, had gone through, this idea of a journey of an Israeli in Palestine, forces us to think about, first of all, what is Israel and what is Palestine? Is it one place or two? And the way it's portrayed quite often is that there's an Israel and there's a Palestine and there's a conflict. Like, there's a war. some people call it a war. Well, that's another thing. Some people call it a war. But when there's a war, it usually means there's two armies fighting. But there's only one army there. It's the Israeli army. Palestinians never had an army. So it's not really a war. Um, so is it one country or two? Is it one place or two? And then if you look at a map from before 1948, so a map that's maybe 75 or 100 years old, it says Palestine. If you look at maps today, it'll say Israel. And maybe some of it will say Palestine. It might have two names. So what's going on here? This is really confusing. The, the only way to get a good grasp of what is going on is to you know, kind of do what I did, which is take that journey and to kind of talk to the people and to see the other side. And for me, the other side was Palestinians. So the country used to be called Palestine, now it's called Israel. And something in the pro happened that, you know, that created that reality. How does a country go from being called one thing to being called another thing? How is it that 100 years ago, or even less than 100 years ago, the vast majority of the people who lived there were Palestinians. It was considered an Arab country. Today, it's considered, a lot of people call it a Jewish country. How does that happen? That's kind of strange. So in my journey, what I, what I realized was that I was living in this part of the country, which is Israel, where there are only Israeli Jews like myself, where the roads are always paved and it's very clean and very safe and, you know, it's kind of living like here, very westernized, very modern. But five minutes away from where I was living, in a completely different reality, in a completely different sphere, were other people. They spoke a different language. They looked a little bit different. They dressed a little bit different. Uh, their roads were full of potholes. It was always dusty. Everything is kind of arid and dry. Um, it looked kind of like chaotic. We were told that it's very unsafe, that it's very dangerous to go there because they hate us. And I couldn't figure out, well, what's going on here? How could there be these two realities so close together in such a small place? Because the entire country is very small, very, very small. Um, and throughout this journey, which is very short geographically because it is a small country, I realized that what was created there was a, two, two different levels of reality, two different levels of existence. One for people like myself, and one for the Palestinians who are actually the natives of the land. Now, I was taught, and I'm sure many of you heard this, that Jews have a right to live in Israel because it's their ancient biblical homeland, that the Jews used to live there thousands of years ago, the ancient Hebrews, and then they were kicked out, and then they returned. 2,000 years later which is a little bit strange. Um, but what happened in the 2,000 years in between? 
what happened there? Who are the people that have lived there? How, you know, you look at pictures of Palestine from 100 years ago, you see cities, you see a lot of people, they're thriving, there's an economy, there's there are newspapers and movie theaters, and there's life. You look at pictures now, and you look at the Palestinian side, and it looks terrible. And you look at the Israeli side, and it looks really, really nice. Something happened in the process. And to me, that was really troubling. What happened in the process? How could the process that many of us, my, me, first of all, primarily, but everybody around in America and the West in general, consider to be a really good thing, a fair and just and positive thing, which is the so-called return of the Jews, how could it have created such a terrible reality for other people? What was the process? So to you know, fast forward to where we are today, as I look at it, and what I saw and what I realized throughout this journey is that there are two narratives, there are two stories, there are two histories. And they can't both be right because they're diametrically opposed. One story talks about the right of the Jews to return and their heroic um, kind of resurgence into the world and to having their own state and their own identity and so on. And the other one talks about massacres, forced exile, destruction, genocide. Well, th <laughs> these two stories can't live together. You have to pick one. And how do you pick one? The only way to pick one is to study and figure out for yourself which is true. And the reality that I found myself in is looking at the story that I was raised on and the history that I thought was true, I didn't think was true, I knew was true, turned out to be a lie. So how do you wrap your head around that? The entire history that you learned, that your family was a part of, was a lie. And the story of the tragedy, of the ethnic cleansing, of the destruction, of the massacres, is true. And it was all caused by the people that I thought were the good guys, my, my people, including my family. So the Israeli army suddenly, in my eyes, went from being this glorious, heroic entity, you know, the, the, the descendants of King David, and you know, that, that, that's kind of how it's always portrayed, to becoming war criminals and terrorists. That's a pretty sharp turn. And it messes you up for a while, because right? you start questioning your identity and, and what's right and what's wrong. And well, who am I in all of this then? Because if that's my family and everything I thought was right turns out to be wrong and I'm here, w w what's my role in all this? But the reality is the reality. And you have to you either choose to accept it or you choose to deny it. You, it can't, you know, you, there's no compromising. When things are that extreme, there's no room for compromise. There's very little gray area. It's like you either accept racism or reject racism. There's no gray area. You accept violence or you reject violence. There's very little gray area. So I had to pick. And the more I engaged, the more I journeyed into Palestine. And Palestine, I realized, was really not just a little spot here and a little spot there, but the entire country, I realized that my existence there is a result of settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing, terrorism. And the reality in which Palestinians live is a result of that. So when you're, I grew up in Jerusalem. But you know, you travel around the country. But particularly in Jerusalem, there are all these neighborhoods where we are told, where you, you there are all these beautiful houses that are called Arab homes. Now, growing up, we never said Palestinians. We said Arabs. A lot of Israelis still won't say the word Palestinian. They'll just say they're Arabs, which they are, but they're Arabs with a particular identity. And you see all these Arab homes, but there are no Arabs. They're all inhabited by Israelis. And nobody ever asked, and I didn't ask either, well, where are the Arabs? And by the way, why are there so many refugees in Gaza? Nobody asked that question. Why are there so many refugees in refugee camps around our country? And why are they so angry? Why do they hate us? Nobody ever makes that connection. Well, if these are Arab homes, and they're inhabited by Israelis, and over here you have a refugee camp, 
of people that must have, if they're refugees, that means they must have been thrown out of somewhere and they can't go back. And they're angry. <laughs> it's, it doesn't take a lot to figure out what happened. And then when I was growing up, the part of Jerusalem in which I, I, grew, I was raised, there are no Arabs, there are no Palestinians, not anywhere near. We, I mean, they weren't our neighbors, they didn't go to our schools, you know, it was complete segregation. There were no Arabs at all, no Palestinians at all. But there are all these Arab homes, all these neighborhoods with Arab homes, and there's Arabic writing on them, and you know they're kind of old and very beautiful, very distinct. And then I remembered, my mother told me a story when I was a kid, um, how she, when she was young, and she was born and raised in Jerusalem too, at one point in 1948, which is the war where Israel was established, um, she was offered to move into a home, into one of these Arab homes, and she refused. And the reason she refused is because that home used to belong to somebody else, to Palestinians. And she felt it was wrong to take the home of a family that was just kicked out. And I remember the story always bothered me. It always troubled me. There was something wrong about the story. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Only later in life, when I was actually writing my book, I realized, wait a minute. I didn't know there were Arabs. In, there used to be Arabs here. There used to be Palestinians in this side, on this side of Jerusalem. We know there's another side of Jerusalem, because it was divided for many years, where there were Palestinians. But there were Palestinians on this side, too. And then if you, somebody mentioned Edward Said, for example, here and so forth, as I meet Palestinians living in, you know, all around the world, many of them talk about how they used to live in those homes. So in other words, they were thrown out by force at gunpoint. And I'm sure you've heard the term ethnic cleansing. The part of Jerusalem that became the Jerusalem that I grew up in that became a part of Israel was very thoroughly, very effectively, you know, the result of ethnic cleansing. Not a single Palestinian family, not a single Palestinian person was left. They were all kicked out. And for most Israelis, that part of Jerusalem was Jerusalem because it was Israeli, we thought. It was we never thought about it, you know, it was just the Israeli part of Jerusalem. And then there's the Arab part of Jerusalem, which is East Jerusalem, which is very different. So, you, you know, you begin to come to terms with the fact that you're like the whites in the South here in the United States, or like the white people in South Africa. You know, you're the perpetrator, maybe not you, me personally, but the reality in which I live, and the people that I know were the perpetrators of a terrible crime a war crime, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and so on. Um, now we're looking at a reality where the United States gives Israel something like almost $20 million a day. That's more money than any country, any, anybody gives anybody, I think, in the world. Think about it. That's a lot of money. Multiply it by, you know, 365 days, multiply that year after year after year after year, and figure out how much money that is. It's, 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 it, blows you, it blows you away. I mean, the, amounts, the absurd amounts of money. And I grew up in Israel. Israel is not a poor country. It doesn't need foreign aid. I mean, there's some poor people, some rich people. You know, it's like any other normal Western country. Why is it getting so much money? Why is it getting more money than, say, countries in Africa who really need it? And then you start looking at all the politics and you start looking at the relationship between the countries and then you start looking at American politics and you see that there's this very strange connection, very, let's see, unhealthy relationship between these two countries. And then you look at the media and then you look at the history books that people, that you guys learn in school. And I have, you know, I had two boys who went through, you know, high school, they're in college, and then I have a daughter who's in high school now, and I look at what they're learning about, the, about that part of the world. And it's like, I want, I want to scream. How can you possibly have all these people in this country learn the wrong thing about a country to which they give so much money? Why isn't the truth being exposed? Why don't Americans know that there's something very wrong going on there? 
And then I decide to do what I do, which is write books and talk and, and so forth. So that's the reality from, you know, that I'm in. That's the reality from which, I, from which I came. And when I talk to people um, here in America, it's really hard for them to hear this. Quite often it's very hard for them to hear this. Regardless if they're Jewish or not Jewish, if they're Arabs or not Arabs, regardless of that, describing the reality on the ground there the way I do is really, really hard for people to hear. Even young people like yourselves, because we all come from something. We all, we've all heard about this. And some people are, feel very strongly about this. Most people feel very strongly about how important it is to support Israel, and that Israel, the Israelis are right, and the Arabs are terrorists, and so forth. And then you have to wonder, why in America do people think that Arabs are terrorists? Why is there such a negative view of Arabs in America? Who does it serve? When you look at Arab communities, in America, when you look at Palestinian communities in Israel, when you look at the Arab world in general, you know, generally you see you know, high levels of education, uh, commitment to serving, commitment to being, you know, uh, uh, volunteering and you know, helping the community and being a part of, uh, a positive part of having a positive impact in the community, very low crime rates. What happened here? How did, this, how did we end up with such a distorted view about the Arab world and about Arabs and about Muslims, and why? And these are questions that I'm throwing out. I'm not going to answer them, but I think these are things that are important for each and every one of you and the people beyond this class as well to look at. How did such positive communities that contribute so much, that are so highly educated, that have such low crime rates, suddenly become terrorists? become associated with terrorism. Whether it's in, in Israel, maybe it makes kind of sense. In Palestine itself, maybe it's kind of, because there's, you know, there's an attempt there to kick them out, and you know, they're the enemy. But why here? Why is there such a negative view uh, of Palestinians and Arabs in general here in America? And then you, know, you start to connect the dots, and you see there's, you, know, you, you begin to understand the reality in which we live. And why is it not represented fairly in the press? You know, there's this, um, you know, in Myanmar, we all hear about, you know, the genocide and what's going on there. Why don't we hear anything about Palestine? You know, students are up in arms about the lack of gun control in America and the massacres that we see in schools. This happens in Palestine. Israelis do this in Palestine all the time. 17 peop people being killed in a school for Palestinians is it's just a day in the life of you know, there's a Palestinian girl who's not much younger than you guys who's in prison because she pushed out, kicked out a bunch of soldiers from her house. She's been in prison for three months without a trial, and she's facing a very long prison sentence while, uh, once she is tried. Her name is Ahit Tamimi. Maybe you heard about her. Why, why, why doesn't anybody say anything about that? You know, all the Me Too movement, all the rights of women, and women should be allowed to, you know, fight back and abusing, abusing women and, you know, and all that is so important here. Here's a girl who's 17 years old. She, well, she was 16 when it happened. Armed soldiers invaded her house, invaded her room. She kicked them out, literally, and then slapped one of the officers, which is exactly what she should have done. You know, I have a daughter. If my, if, you know, I would hope my daughter would have the courage to do just that if, if, you know, if men were invading her space and, and her home. She's in jail for that, you know? So these are things that are important that, that I think need to be looked at. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my new book. The, the second the new book, which just came out, Injustice, is in a way kind of answers a lot of these questions because that is a story of something that has taken place here in the United States. So Palestinians are being persecuted and killed by Israelis in a way, it makes sense. With you. Whether you agree with it or not, it makes sense because, you know, there's this reality over there, very violent reality going on over there. But why here? And then one day I heard the story about five Palestinian Muslims who are in, um, in federal prison. And these guys were part of a charity organization, a relief organization that was called the Holy Land Foundation. And the Holy Land Foundation was, at one point, the largest Muslim charity organization in America. So they raised funds mostly for, to help 
Palestinians in need, but they also helped in, in other places. They, were, they helped after the Oklahoma City bombing. You guys must have heard of that. They provided relief, to af relief after 9-11. They provided relief wherever there were natural you know, uh, disasters, floods, earthquakes, here in the US, around the world. They're very active. And they were highly regarded and respected charity. And then, after 9-11, a few months after 9-11, President George Bush came out and closed them down and announced that they are a designated terrorist organization, a terrorist funding uh, organization. In other words, that all their money was being given to terrorism or to terrorist organizations, and therefore they had to be closed down. So they were closed down, all their money, all their assets were frozen, and they were designated themselves a terrorist organization. Now, the United States has a process where they designate organizations or people as terrorists, and then they are on a list. So after 9-11, everybody thought, well, obviously the government's panicking. Obviously the government's got to show that they're doing something. So they just round up the usual suspects, and it'll all blow over. It'll be fine. And when the government does something like that, we as citizens have the right to sue the government and say, excuse me, you made a mistake. This is wrong. We're not a terrorist organization. We want our money back, and we want to be, you want, we want the designation as a terrorist organization to be taken away. We did nothing wrong. So they hired lawyers, some very good lawyers, and they sued the government. And when the government, when the government uh, does something like this, they have to go to court and show, you know, what, what's the proof? It's called an administrative record with all the proof that the government has against you or against them. And all they had were photocopies of faxes that were sent by the government of Israel. They didn't have any statements under oath, uh, nothing that was notarized. They had a few translations of documents that turned out to be wrong, and news a few newspaper articles. Just a really weak case. No real concrete evidence. So the defense team put together all the evidence to show that these guys did nothing wrong. Every penny that they raised, you could show, see exactly where it went. And it all went to charity. It all went to relief. So they thought, this is going to be an easy case. So they went to court. And feeling very confident. And the judge dismissed the case and struck all the evidence from the file. So none of their evidence could count, and the case was dismissed. And they couldn't believe it. How could, they, how could a judge just dismiss the case and strike the evidence? Well, she did. Now, this is kind of crazy anyway, but one thing that was particularly crazy about it was that there was a particular document in the, in the administrative record where the guy that managed their office in Jerusalem because they were dealing with Palestine, right? Says that, yes, they did give money to Hamas, which is considered a terrorist organization in the United States. So the lawyers thought, OK, this is a problem. If their own manager on the ground says that they gave money to Hamas, then they're supporting a terrorist organization, right? Because here in the United States, Hamas was designated as a terrorist organization. Hamas is a Palestinian you know, Islamic resistance movement. Now, that particular guy was arrested by the Israelis, so the lawyers here contacted his lawyer back there. And she said, what are you talking about? I have all of his statements. He never said anything of the kind. So she faxed all of his statements. And they went to a, an, like a, a real a, a, a translation firm where they had done a translation and notarized it, signed under oath, and he said exactly the opposite. He said, we had never given any money to Hamas. We do not support any political organization, any military organization, all we do is relief. Now, the correct translation was in the file with the evidence that was struck out. The wrong translation remained because that's the, that was in the, in the government's file. So how do you proceed from there? How do you go from there? I mean, the lawyers just couldn't figure out what was going on. Because there are laws and regulations that are supposed to protect citizens who are innocent, right? And the judge just struck it all out. So they appealed. And the appellate court said, look, the judge shouldn't have done this. 
This was wrong. But this is not a normal case. This is a case of national security, and therefore, we're going to leave it. And suddenly, these lawyers, and I spoke to them. I talk about them in the book. You know, these are serious, seasoned human rights lawyers that have been doing this work for a long time. They're blown away. They couldn't figure out what was going on. How could this happen in America, where the justice system is supposed to protect us, where there are laws and regulations and rules that are supposed to protect innocent people? And then it dawned on them. And all the lawyers that were involved that I spoke to said the same thing. After 9-11, there was a reality here where Muslim Arabs, Muslims and Arabs cannot get a fair trial. Instead of being innocent, presumed innocent until proven guilty, it was the other way around. They're presumed guilty, and then it's up to them to prove their innocence, although, even though the reality was that they, they're not even given that opportunity. So you have to wonder, what's going on in America? Is the justice system corrupt, politicized, or is it pure and clean and, 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 and just the way it's supposed to be? Are there political prisoners in America? Is there a problem with political persecution in America? Because most people think there isn't. Most people think this is a real democracy. So what's going on? Then what the government did is they started preparing a criminal trial against these guys. And the lawyers thought, why a criminal trial? They did nothing wrong. Their taxes were in order. Their papers were in order. Every dime that they got was accounted for. What could they possibly charge them with? It was clear that they didn't give money to Hamas. They didn't give money to, to terrorism. What could you possibly charge them with? And the problem was this. The President of the United States said that these people are terrorists. The President of the United States shut down the organization and said that that is a designated terrorist funding network. Now everybody's got to prove that the President was right. The fact the President said it, even though he had no proof, is a problem. But now he said it. So the government has to do everything it possibly can to quickly create a case. So then they said, well, you know what? They actually didn't give money to terrorism. That's right. But because they gave money to help poor Palestinians, that, in a roundabout way, helped the terrorists. And so that's why they gave what is called material support. Material support means they gave stuff. They gave some kind of support that, in the end, ended up helping terrorism. And that's what they went to trial with. They went to trial saying, well, they didn't give money directly to Hamas. They gave money to others, and that helped Hamas. So they said, well, the two, big, the two main examples were this. One was that they were helping orphans. Now, you've got to hear this to believe this. I mean, it was, it's beyond belief. They had a, a program where they're helping Palestinian orphans. Now, why are there so many Palestinian orphans? Because Israel was killing a lot of Palestinians. So there was a serious orphan problem. So they said, you see, the reason these kids are orphans is because their fathers were terrorists. So if you're going to help these orphans, you're not only supporting the terrorists, you're encouraging more people to become terrorists. So the theory was, well, if you're a father and you know your family is going to be taken care of, then of course you're going to join a terrorist group and blow yourself up, right? I mean, wouldn't you do it? All of us? Anyone would do this, right? Makes perfect sense. And they had real experts. People who sit on uh, think tanks in Washington, D.C. say this. It's well known that if somebody knows their family is going to be taken care of, then of course they're going to join a terrorist organization. It makes perfect sense. Now, besides the fact that that's utterly racist and complete nonsense, they took a look at the actual cause of death of the fathers of these orphans. And not a single one died as a result of what you might call terrorism. Not a single one. And then what I did, I took a look at the list of Palestinians who participated in what was called suicide missions, which is something that hasn't been happened, happened in a very long time. But there were several years where that was a big problem. None of them had children. So either way you look at it, the orphans did not become orphans as a result of terrorism. So supporting these orphans has nothing to do with that. But in the court of law, this stuck. And this was permitted. 
Then the other thing they were saying, well, they're helping, they were helping the families of Palestinian prisoners. Israel has thousands and thousands of Palestinian prisoners, which they call terrorists. So I took a look, and you can see, if you look at the list of the, ter of the, of the Palestinians that are held by Israeli jails and the, what they were charged with, the vast majority were never charged with acts of violence. They're all political prisoners. So we're talking about the families of political prisoners, not terrorists. So even in that, nothing, it has nothing to do with supporting their families. It's not supporting terrorism. It's supporting their families, supporting the families of political prisoners. What could be wrong with that? So that was the kind of case that the government presented. And it took two trials. The first trial, they weren't able to convict. The second trial, they convicted all of them. And these are five men who are sitting now, as we speak, in federal prisons. And they received sentences from 15 to 65 years. From 15 to 65 years in federal prison. So when I heard the story, my first reaction was, well, it's a, it doesn't make sense. So then I looked into it. I started meeting their families. I started communicating with them in, in prison. You can email people in jail. And then this whole world of, of, of what I thought was unbelievable stuff you know, was exposed to me, and which is why I decided to write this book. Now, the two things that people don't believe when I tell them the story, number one is that the justice system can be so corrupt and politicized that every judge along the way, all the juries along the way, the appellate courts along the way, everybody had agreed that these guys have to go to jail, even though all the evidence showed that they did nothing wrong. As Americans, people don't want to believe it, and you can't blame them for not wanting to believe it, but they just don't want to believe it, that the justice system could be so one-sided, so unfair, and so corrupt. The other thing is that Americans have a hard time Accepting is that there are political prisoners in America. There is political persecution in America. And it didn't start now. If you learn a little bit about the history of uh, blacks in America, about the Black Panthers, and so forth, you see that this is something that's already been going on. The black community in America is fully aware that there is political persecution and political prisoners in America. So it started way back then. Yeah. What year was what? This? It, well, it started after 9-11. So it started in like 2001. So it started in 2001. By 2009, they were all convicted and in jail. The process was a lengthy process. So um, I want to read to you a couple of things that, uh, that are in the book that I think are um, well, let me tell you the names of the guys. I think that's important, too, the name of these five men, OK? Abdurrahman Ode, he's from, I mean, they're all Palestinians. They're all Palestinians who immigrated here to America as students. He's in for 15 years in federal prison. And Mohammed Al-Mazain, 15 years in federal prison. Are any of those Palestinian Americans now, they have citizenship here, too? Or Most of them do, yeah. Most of them. Most of them do. Only one, only one of them. He was in the process while this happened, so he never got the citizenship. And now it's a problem. Bufid Abdul Qadir got 20 years. Shukri Abu Bakr got 65 years. And Hassan Elashi got 65 years. And I was able to meet four of them in prison. For the fifth one, Hassan Elashi, for some reason, the prison authorities would not permit me to see him. And I don't know why. Because when you go to visit a prisoner, uh, you have to you know, apply and so forth. And they have to approve you. And then you're placed on a list of approved um, Visitors. Um, now, you know, when you hear a story, certain things kind of stick in your mind. Certain impressions just stick in your mind. So I want to describe a couple of things to you that stuck in my mind. I'm going to read them because uh, I, want, I want to get them just the way they're in the book. Now, the, they were actually arrested. They were actually arrested in 2004. So you know, there's a process there. And this is one of the impressions that stuck in my mind. 20-year-old Zaira Abu Bakr was still in bed in her parents' home when she heard the banging on the front door. 
She looked at her phone and noticed several missed calls and a message from her friend, Noor Elashi. She opened the message from Noor first, and it contained one word, Aju. Aju in, in Arabic means, they came. In other words, there was something that they were anticipating for many, many years. And when it actually happened, all she had to say was, basically, it's here. They came. So she didn't have to explain who they were. She didn't have to explain when they came, where they came, what they wanted. It was absolutely clear. And what it was, really, is in the following description. At precisely 7 a.m. Central Time on July 27, 2004, the homes of Shukri Abu Bakr, Ghassan Elashi, Mufid Abdul Qadir, Abdul Rahman Odeh, and Muhammad Al Mazain were raided by, raided by local and federal officers. All five men who became known as the Holy Land Foundation Five were taken into custody. Four years and two trials later, all five were sent to federal prison, serving sentences ranging from 15 to 65 years. Um, Holy Land Foundation was at one time the largest Muslim charity organization in America. And on December the 4th, 2001, it was shut down by President George Bush without due process using a presidential executive order. Federal agents raided the charity's offices and seized all the documents, assets, and funds of the organization as well as personal property of the employees. Now, all the documents that were taken uh, were classified. So the defense didn't have access to them. So when the government said such and such a thing took place, the defense did not have access to the same documents. They also learned that these guys' phones were tapped. Um, and all of their conversations were transcribed. And because they were Arabs, they spoke Arabic, and so they had to be translated. Well, all of that was classified, and they did not have access to that either. So it was very hard for the defense to argue anything because who knows what was translated and how it was translated, and many of the things were translated wrong. Um, and I want to tell you just a little bit, something, a little something personal about, uh, not all of them, but a couple of them. So the first one that I was uh, involved with was Shukri. He was the CEO of the, uh, of the charity. And he's the first one I communicated with, and I dedicated the book to his daughter, Sanabil. And so um, I'm going to read you a couple of the emails that he sent to me, just so you get an idea of what kind of person he was. He wrote to me, Shuk, uh, Miko, we're out of lockdown this morning. I took advantage of my solitude to finish up some important readings that included revising my memorization of the Quran and an introduction to neuro-linguistic programming. And then he says, the first book I read in, my, in the first months of my incar incarceration, where I was in solitary for three months, was Man's Search for Meaning by Dr. Viktor Frankl. It's a very well-known book. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. He illuminated his secret to Holocaust survival, survival, how to turn one predicament into human achievement, and how man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or avoid pain, but to, see me to seek meaning in his life. And then he talked about his daughter, uh, Senabil. He said, with Sanabil out there fighting three chronic killers, holding on as strong as she could, waiting for her daddy to come home, was, heart, was heartbreaking. I knew I wasn't coming home anytime soon. Then about a year later, he wrote to me the following email. He said, Sanabil is on her deathbed fighting for her life. She was born very ill, and so she was ill her whole life. At this point, she's 25, 26. Please keep her in your thoughts. Her mission on Earth is about finished. She says she won't go before she can see me. And I said, baby, I'll always be with you no matter where or when you go. And then a few days after that email, he sent me the following email. Uh, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, Sanabil passed away on Tuesday, May 14, 2013, at 2 AM. She went peacefully and gracefully. She will be buried today. I praise Allah for what he had allowed me to keep with my remaining daughters uh, and my wonderful wife, uh, Wujdan. And of course, the prison authorities didn't allow him to see his daughter one last time uh, before she died. So this is the kind of reality, this is the kind of uh, personal tragedy 
that this case uh, represents. So we've got this bigger story, you know, Israel-America relationship, which is all the politics of Israel and Palestine and how the United States is involved with that. Then you've got the whole judicial issue, the, the, the court system, the judges, the justice system that, w that, that turned against them. And then you've got a very, very, very heartbreaking personal story. And each one of them has a personal story that's similar to that, you know, that's kind of like that. Um, and what I try to do is touch on all of them because they're all important. We need to really feel the, the, just how tragic this was and what effect it had on the people and the community. Like I said, the Arab and Muslim community, and particularly the Palestinian community. And then understand how the justice system works and when it doesn't function and the politics uh, that are behind this. Um, you know, people often ask me, so how's it going to end? Well, there were two trials, at the end of which they were all found guilty and they were all convicted. Uh, they went to the appellate court. The appellate court agreed that there were a lot of mistakes made by the, during the trials, but they upheld the decision of the judges, and so they didn't do anything. The Supreme Court refused to hear the case. And then before President Obama left office, there was an attempt to try to get him to commute their sentences and deport them. And there were several countries that were willing to accept them and give them citizenship. Because the common knowledge is, outside of, I guess, the courtroom in Texas where they were convicted, is that these men did nothing wrong. And this case was an incredible miscarriage of justice. So there were several countries that were willing to accept them and give them citizenship, but uh, President Obama wouldn't do it. He wasn't willing to do it. And I didn't think he would. You know, when the process was going on, some people asked me if I thought he would do it. I said, no, he's not going to do it. You know, there's not a single, there's not an American president alive that would commute the sentences of five convicted Palestinians, you know, convicted on terrorism charges. Um, so what's going to happen? I, nobody knows. I mean, I wrote this book hoping that, you know, people would read it and there would be some kind of uh, an outcry saying, this is a terrible injustice, let's do something. Because you know, what typically happens in cases like this is that 100 years later, somebody apologizes. And then they erect a little statue for them, like Sacco and Vanzetti. Some of us are old enough to, you know, the case of Sacco and Vanzetti, you know, two immigrants that were, you know, wrongly charged of murder. Then 100 years later, some governor says, oh, this was a terrible injustice, and let's put a little uh, statue in their memory. Well, they're dead now. Nobody cares. So that something will happen while these guys are still alive and, and so forth. Um, and I think that their status as political prisoners is exactly the same as Palestinians who are held by Israel in Israeli jails, who are also political prisoners. And I don't think any of them are going to be released until all of Palestine becomes Palestine again, until all of Palestine is free and Palestinians can live and the country is called Palestine again, the way I believe it should be called. So uh, that seems a pretty daunting reality because you know, Israel is a very strong country with a lot of support. Israel does not want Palestine to become Palestine again. Certainly, um, most Americans agree with Israel, so this seems pretty hopeless. Um, but things do change if we want them to change, if we work hard enough. And when I say we, I mean each and every single one of us here and in other classrooms and other places around the world where I talk about this and other people talk about this. Um, and uh, the spin that I wear that says BDS, represents a movement that calls to impose boycott sanctions um, on Israel until such time that Israel complies with international law that allows for freedom for Palestinians, equal rights for Palestinians, releases political prisoners, and so on. So if anybody here is interested in freedom and injustice and uh, that sort of thing and um, feels that they stand on the side that opposes racism and opposes violence, then I would invite all of you to take a look into that. Go online, Google BDS uh, Palestine, and, uh, and get involved and get engaged. Because so much of our money, all of our money here, goes there. And so much of that money, well, I would say all of that money, goes to impose a terrible injustice and a terrible tragedy on the Palestinian people that all of us are really responsible, whether we like it or not, for the injustice. We all have a hand in it because it's our money. 
So unless we stand up and say, no, you can't have our money if you're going to use that. We're not going to elect you. We're not going to vote for you if you give that money to Israel. Then we're all complicit. It's an absurd reality where we're guilty of something even though we did nothing, but by doing nothing, we're guilty because, of, because this is America. So I'd invite all of you to take a look at this Google, you know, look at BDS, look at Palestine, learn more about it. And if you agree with what's going on, that's one thing. But if you disagree, as I, I, uh, I expect you would, then you know, do something about it. Anyway, I'll end here. You guys might have some questions. Thank you very much. What is your relationship with your family? Like, how do they feel about you? <laughs> Um, well, that's interesting. Um, so my family went uh, went a little bit into this journey that I went into. For example, uh, my father was a general, but after he retired, he started talking about how Israel needs to make peace with the Palestinians based on this idea, which you, you may have heard, it's called a two-state solution, where Palestinians will be allowed to have their own state in a tiny part of Palestine and then make peace with Israel. And then he became kind of a champion for Palestinian rights, but within that framework. And so um, most of my family is kind of, kind of agrees with that framework. They don't reject Israel the way I do. They don't reject the idea of settler colonialism and racism to the extent that I do. So our conversations go up to a certain point, and then after that, they kind of, there's no point in talking. So I'll come back from, um, you know, protesting with Palestinians and having tear gas and bullets shot and stuff like that, and then I'll go home to the very safe and clean and um, almost weird reality, which is a half hour drive from, from there. And nobody asks any questions. Nobody really wants to talk about it. You know, uh, this girl that I talked about, Ahit Tamimi, her father is one of my best friends. And I was just there two weeks ago, and I spent a, a few days with him, four days or something. And when I came home, nobody wants to talk about it. You know, they hear what they hear on the news, and everybody has their opinion, but there's really no, not a lot of conversation about this because it's a dead end. There's nowhere to go. Um, so we have a relationship. I mean, I, we, I have a good relationship with my family, but it's uh, on this particular issue, it's, 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 it's pretty tense. And I think that's kind of typical. My, you know, my, I have an advantage because, like I said, most of my family is a little bit more advanced into this issue than most Israeli families. So it's not like there's a disconnect or people hate each other or anything like that. Um, but uh, I've gone like beyond what's pe most people's comfort level in, in, within Israeli society. Yeah. Can you tell the story about your sister and, and your niece? Yeah. Okay. So I one of the things I talk about in the book. You know, these guys in injustice they were accused of supporting Hamas. What's Hamas? So I talk a lot about what Hamas is in the book. Hamas is, a, is the Islamic uh, resistance movement, the Palestinian resistance movement, but that came out of the Islamic movement. Palestinians have always had resistance organizations that came with certain political uh, ideologies. And the Islamic movement stayed away from uh, resistance and from politics for a very long time. They just had their own charities. They did their own work. And then 1987, when the first what's called the first Palestinian uprising, began, they were kind of forced to you know, participate as well. And that's when they formed this organization called Hamas, which is the Islamic movement's resistance. Now, Hamas was considered a terrorist organization here in the United States, like I said, um, later on. Uh, and one of the things that, one of the things that they participated, not only them, but one of the things that they became known for were suicide missions, which I'm sure you heard about. And in 1997, in a suicide mission in Jerusalem, my sister's little girl was killed. She was 13 years old. So here am I now writing this book and talking about these guys who supposedly, you know, and Hamas, the, Hamas is a big part of this story. So I had to kind of come to terms with, uh, you know, what do I think of Hamas and uh, how do I feel about all this? 
Now, when this happened, when she was killed, it became a big story in Israel because she's the granddaughter of, of a famous Israeli general. So, and he's a famous Israeli general who then became kind of known for becoming a champion for Palestinian rights. So it was a bit, it was a confusing story, but it was a big story. And then, so of course, um, you know, my sister's house was full of journalists from all over the world, you know. Uh, Bob Simon was there. I mean, everybody was there. And they wanted to know, you know, what about retaliation and revenge and all this? And my sister came out, her mother, who just lost her daughter, and she said, uh, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. Don't talk to me about killing more people. Killing people as a response to the death of a child is insane. It's, how, could that be, how could that be acceptable? So she said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. Don't talk to me about retaliation and revenge. And then she said, in terms of who's responsible, she said, well, who's responsible for this reality in which Palestinians live? Who's responsible for the killing of Palestinian children on a daily basis, in their schools, on the streets, in their homes? Who's responsible for the fact that for all these years, Palestinians have had no rights, no access to water, no freedom? The thousands and thousands of Palestinian fathers, mothers, and children are in Israeli jails. We are. The Israeli government is. And so she said, I hold the Israeli government responsible for my child's death. Because you can't hold people oppressed, deny their rights, deny them water, kill them, and expect they'll do nothing in return. Expect that there'll be no price to be paid. So yes, this was her daughter. This is my niece. This is a girl that we all knew and loved. And it's very personal. At the same time, you, you, you can't just focus on the personal. You have to see the big picture, particularly if you want to see it end. Um, so that was her response. You know, number one, the Israeli government is responsible. Number two, don't talk to me about killing uh, more people. So this whole issue of Hamas for me was, uh, you know, it helped me come to terms, actually, when I wrote this book. Because one of these guys, one of the five, is the brother of uh, a guy called Khaled Mash'al, who was the face of Hamas. He was the political head of Hamas for many, many years. And his brother, who here did nothing wrong and he hadn't seen in many, many years, was, was um, pulled into this and is serving 20 years in jail because that's his brother. So anyway, there was a lot of, I, I had to come to terms with, uh, with Hamas, with the death of my, and I also, you know, the more you dig, the more you find out, the more confusing it becomes, and so it kind of forces you, when you write, to come to terms with a lot of things you didn't think you had to come to terms with. So it was a very good process for me. But anyway, that was, the, that was my, uh, my relationship and my connection with Hamas had to do with that. You mentioned the Tamimis, and I know you do film class, so uh, the film Five Broken Cameras features the Tamimis. No, Five Broken Cameras is Belaine. It's a different family. Ah, a different family. My yeah. confusion. It's another but family that's a lot. It's a great film. It's a good it's film, and it's another family. It's, it's another, not the Tamimis. Another family. But if you Google, if you go on YouTube and you put in Tamimi, Ahit Tamimi, or Tamimi, you'll see, the, you'll see her arrest. I mean, she's, I don't know if you've, anybody heard of the case of Ahit Tamimi here? A few people. If you, you should see it. You know, you should see this uh, girl push, pushing out three armed Israeli soldiers out of her room, out of her house, and then, and then slapping a soldier. And that slap cost her dearly. But yeah. Yeah. So, um, for students, could you explain to them a little bit, you mentioned the problems with water and also curfew, how it's sort of notions they might not uh, Okay, mention. yeah. So, one of the things when, uh, that I noticed when I began this journey into, the, into Palestine, into the Palestinian sphere, uh, into where Palestinians live, is like I said, you notice that it's dusty and kind of dirty. And the trees aren't as green. They're, no, they're not green. There are no green lawns. It's just not pretty. And one of the things that I grew up learning is that while the Jews came to Palestine and made it all green and wonderful and beautiful, the Arabs are kind of backward. And so look, they've, look, 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 look at how they live. And you hear this from a lot of people who are tourists who visit the country. 
And sometimes it's like literally across the street, you'll have a, uh, an Israeli town across the street from a Palestinian town or village. And you see it. I mean, one is green and beautiful, and one is dusty and arid. And the trees are dying. And so if you don't know, and you're touched like I would suspect most of us are, with that little, in, in, infected a little bit by, that, by, by, the, by the racist uh, uh, infection, then the conclusion is, well, this side, look at them. They're advanced, you know, they're modern, and these guys are backwards, and they're just dirty. But if you take the journey like I did, and you investigate a little bit more, you find out that Palestinians, who make up more than half of the population in the entire country, only get 3% of the water. So all the water is allocated by a, a water authority, which is an Israeli water authority. They're responsible for, for the water. They allocate only 3% of the water to the Palestinian population, which I'll say again, makes up more than half of the population. So for example, Tamimi family, this friend of mine whose daughter was just arrested, he lives, they live in a village and literally across the street from, a Palestine, from, a, from an Israeli town. And on their side, it's all dry. On the Israeli side, it's all green. Well, they only get something like between 10 and 12 hours of running water per week. The Israelis get all the water they want, all the water they need. They want, they want green lawns, they have green lawns. They want swimming pools, they have swimming pools. They don't have to worry about taking a shower, cooking, doing the laundry, the Palestinians get 10 to 12 hours of running water per week, so your priorities are different. Well, unless you know this, unless you're aware of this, this incredible injustice of this, of this uh, you know, if, if you want to kill someone other than shooting them, you deny them water, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Unless you're aware of this, you, the, the assumption is, well, there's something wrong with these Arabs. And look how wonderful. And you hear this from people who visit all the time. Look what a great job the Jews have done. Look what a terrible job the Arabs and Palestinians are doing. Okay, but nobody takes the, very few people takes the next step, the extra step to say, well, why is it like this? And unless you do, you're not going to, you know, we're not going to know. Um, another thing that the Israelis do, use a lot, is curfews and closed military zones. So curfew is a curfew. Nobody's allowed to leave the house. That's it, curfew. Nobody's allowed to leave their house from a certain time to a certain time until the military commander says so. And if anybody leaves, they get shot. So that happened. It doesn't happen that much now, but it used to happen a lot. Uh, and a lot of Palestinians, um, quite often what they would do is, after people already went to work, they'd the military commander would come and declare a curfew. So nobody's allowed to leave the house. Nobody's allowed in the streets. Well, the people already went to work didn't know that. When they come back, they're violating curfew, so they get shot. And there are quite a lot of stories, I mean, too, way too many stories to relate of things like that. But what they do now is they do a closed military zone. So um, there could be a protest. And what's a protest? A protest is a march. People march with flags, with signs, you know, against the oppression, against Israeli th stealing land, and so forth. And then the military commander comes up and he says, well, this is a closed military zone. Everybody get the hell out. And you go, what do you mean closed military zone? This is their land. And they come up with a piece of paper. And I had a story once, which was so absurd. This is just a few months ago. I was in uh, Hebron, which is you know, an ancient city, a Palestinian city. And there's an entire, the main thoroughfare of the old city of Hebron, which used to be this bustling, bustling business center with shops and all that, um, is closed closed to Palestinians. Israelis are free to drive and do what they want, but all the shops are closed, sealed, because the Palestinians are not allowed to be there. So we did this action with a friend of mine, Asa Amro, who's, uh, who lives there. He's a local activist. And we, he, we went and bought a bunch of fruit and vegetables in the market outside or somewhere else, and then came back and we lined. It was myself and a group from Veterans for Peace were visiting, and we stood on the sidewalk, and it's, it's like a ghost town. It's all closed. There's nobody there. We stood on the road with vegetables and fruit, and we're pretending to sell vegetables and fruit, right? I mean, it's a ridiculous sight. I mean, you have to see it to believe it. And Veterans for Peace are a bunch of really old guys. I mean, it's, you know, old guys with ponytails. So it's kind of a, it was kind of a really funny scene. 
no harm to anybody. Just standing there, standing there with cauliflower and lettuce and tomatoes and stuff like that. But to make a point, in less than five minutes, and there's a video, if you look it up, you can see it on YouTube. In less than five minutes, you would think that Osama bin Laden showed up. Commandos, special forces, police, the secret police, the security agencies, everybody came. You would think that Osama bin Laden, they caught him. And here we are, a bunch of old guys, me, I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm, you know, and we're selling cauliflower and lettuce, and, and as the soldiers are there, you know, trying to take away the cauliflower from us, <laughs> one of the officers, a young guy, shows up and he says, close military zone. What do you mean close military zone? What, what are you talking about? So he shows me the piece of paper. So he said, my Palestinian friend goes, now it's in Hebrew, Palestinians don't read Hebrew, but it's all in Hebrew. So he says to me, read and tell me what it says. What's the, is there a date? I'm looking at it. There's no date. Is it signed? It's not signed. So we tell the officer, this is nonsense. It's not dated or signed. Where'd you come, what are you talking about? So this young officer goes off, and I'm following him, and he signs it and puts the date. Now, it's supposed to be signed by a general. He's nowhere near being a general. I'm going, what are you doing? You just signed this. This is, this is nonsense. But that's it. Closed military zone. As a Palestinian or somebody who supports Palestinian, you have no say. Besides, you should see the amount of weapons they bring. These are commandos. And you go, you bring commandos to this? You can bring two cops and tell us to shoot, and we probably shoot. They bring an entire platoon of commandos, plus the police, plus everybody else. And everybody is like, machine guns. We're not talking about, you know, it's beyond belief. But they use the military, closed military zone. They will do it in somebody's house. They'll come up and say, this house is a closed military zone. Well, what, what, what does that mean? The people are not allowed in. They're not allowed out. Uh, they use, um, they use um, demolition, demolition orders. I have Palestinian friends who have a demolition order on their house. Well, what does that mean? It just means that one day the army is going to come and destroy their house and give them like an hour notice. And they are in Jerusalem alone there are over 15,000 demolition orders. That's in one city. Um, and, you know, countless and countless. And they show up, you have an hour to get all your stuff and you're out. They come with bulldozers, destroy the house. Uh, sometimes what they'll do, and you're going to think I'm making this up. I'm not making this up. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll give the family a choice. Either they have to just demolish their own house, or if the military does it, they're given a bill and they have to pay for the demolition of the house. So they have a choice. So this is just how absurd and horrifying uh, this reality is. And this is how, this is, and this is not, what I'm telling you now is just the day in the life of. There's nothing strange or unique about this for Palestinians. This is the day in the life of. It happens every day to you, to your neighbors, to your best friend, to your cousin. And that's not even, not even beginning to talk about, say, bombings and shootings and killing of people. This is just, you know, making life unlivable. So again, I invite all of you to take a really close look at why the government of America, the United States government, has such close ties to the government of Israel and why they're giving them so much money. Because I don't think any of the things that I told you about today were things that you'd want your money to go to. Well, I would hope not anyway. So. These are things, this, this, is all, this is all important stuff for you to think about. Yeah? Um, this might seem like a dumb question, but how did Israel gain so much control? Like, how did, I mean, if Palestinians were living there first and the Israelis came after, how were they able to control the country so much? Good question. Did everybody hear the question? She, said, she asked, how is it Israel was able to gain so much control so fast if Palestinians were living there? Um, in this context, it's, it's, uh, it's, a hard thing, it's a hard thing to say, but they were very smart. And they planned it very, very well. And so the state of Israel has been in existence for seven decades. Seven decades, 70 years. If we go back about 100 years, 100 years from now, um, there was a movement that pushed for the creation of Israel. It was called the Zionist movement. And the Zionist movement was an ideology that said that Jews 
need to go back to their ancient biblical homeland, which is Palestine. And they called it Palestine. They called it Palestine slash the land of Israel. Now, it was a very small group of Jews that, that started this. Uh, and these were Jews that were completely secular. In other words, they didn't believe in God. They were not religious people. It had nothing to do with that. They thought the Jews were a nation, that the Bible, especially particularly the, the Old Testament, was their history book. They treated it like a history book. And that Palestine was their homeland. And they built an entire ideology, an entire movement based on these three legs. Now, most people, including Jews, didn't see themselves quite as a nation. I mean, because there were French Jews and Polish Jews and, and Moroccan Jews and uh, Syrian Jews and Egyptian Jews and American Jews. And uh, you know what I mean? Jews were everywhere. I mean, there was a sense that, yeah, there's a thing like the Jewish people. But really, Jews are a religion, and they're part of all these other nations. The Zionists said, no. All Jews are the same nation. We're all descendants of this old tribe that lived in Palestine or the land of Israel 3,000 years ago. And therefore, because there's anti-Semitism, which was pre prevalent in Europe, not in the Arab world, but in Europe, then we, all the Jews need to return. Now, this was, like I said, a very small group of completely secular Jews. You know, they didn't look like Jews. They had no beards. They, had, they, they wore normal clothes. They were, you know. Um, and they began a movement, and they started raising money. And they began, and my grandfather was one, of them, was one of them. And they would travel around the world and speak to governments and speak to important people. And many of them had, many of them had connection to, uh, wealth, to wealth, to money. And they decided, and they started spreading this idea, both in Jewish communities and in the you know, major governments around the world. And because they didn't look Jewish, and because they seemed very white and European, it was very easy for them to get access. And because they had access to money, uh, some of them were millionaires, some, you know, there were some Jewish families who had a lot of money, uh, they were able to start this campaign, which today we call lobbying, to influence um, you know, white European nations, white European governments. Now, these white European governments were Christian. And many of them read the Bible literally, too. So they thought, well, maybe this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is like a good thing. You know, the Jews returning to their ancient homeland. It's biblical. It's wonderful. And we can create this little white colony in this Arab country called Palestine. Who cares? Um, and they did a very, very thorough job and gaining influence not only in Jewish communities, but in non-Jewish communities. And in these governments, particularly here in the United States, in Great Britain, uh, and so on. Then they, uh, there was World War II. There was the Holocaust. And many of the nations in the West felt very guilty because of the Holocaust, because of anti-Semitism, because really the Holocaust and the killing of millions of millions of Jews in Europe was, it was not, it was not uh, an act that was, um, you know, it was related, it was connected to anti-Semitism, which was part of European culture. Hating and killing Jews was part of, and parcel of, of Christian European culture at the time. And the Holocaust was just one expression of that. It was a terrible and extreme expression, but it was just one expression of that. So then, the Zionists really knew how to seize this opportunity. And they pushed for a United Nations resolution which would recognize at least part of Palestine as a land for the Jews. At the same time, they were engaged in encouraging Jews to immigrate to Palestine, to start colonizing Palestine. That's where my grandparents went. This was even before the Holocaust. It had nothing to do with the Holocaust. But they were convincing Jews to go and start building and colonizing parts of Palestine. And what they did is they created a mini sphere of Jews only within Palestine. So they didn't participate with the local community. They created their own cities, their own towns, their own education system, their own judicial system, their own healthcare system for Jews only. And they revived Hebrew. Hebrew was a dead language, and they brought back Hebrew as a language. So all these things were happening at the same time. 
Now, there are very few Jews at that time. Like After World War II, there are less than half a million Jews living in Palestine. It was a very small community. The Arab-Palestinian community was a lot bigger, three times bigger at least. Um, but they had developed a very effective, a very well-trained, armed militia, which today people would refer to as a terrorist organization, but an armed militia. My dad was part of that. And all these young Israeli or Jews that were born there already joined. And they felt, you know, we're going to fight for our country, and we're going to regain our land, and we're going to do this for the Jewish people, and after the Holocaust, you know, blah, blah, blah. In 1947, the United Nations passed a resolution to partition Palestine, create a Jewish state, and an Arab state. Immediately, when the, the diplomatic side of the Zionist movement were, was able to achieve that, that was a huge accomplishment, the military side and the people on the ground began a massive campaign a military campaign, which was a campaign of ethnic cleansing. And within a year, within a year, they destroyed the vast majority of Palestine and kicked out the vast majority of Palestinians. About a million Palestinians were forced out. Hundreds and hundreds of towns and cities were completely, completely wiped off the face of the earth. Within a year. That's incredibly fast. Now, the Palestinians never had an army. Palestinians never had a force. They didn't think they needed an army. They were the people of the land. They didn't think that they were going to be invaded by these, you know, that this reality was going to take place. So they had no fighting force. So within a year, done. The state of Israel was established. Now, the United Nations defined certain boundaries for the Jewish state, for the Jewish part of Palestine when they partitioned it. But the Zionists weren't happy with that. They wanted more. So they ended up conquering a lot, you know, 80% of the country. Within a year, that 80% of the country, they kicked out the majority of the Palestinians, destroyed the majority of Palestinian towns, and you had Israel. So they had the diplomatic group that was working in America, in Britain, in the United Nations. They had the military already ready and prepared and armed and trained. And you had enough, they had enough Jews there to establish something. And then it went from there. So now the world is looking and saying, wow, look at this. After the Holocaust, the Jews are back, and maybe we don't have to feel so bad about the Holocaust after all. Maybe we don't have to feel so bad about anti-Semitism after all, because after all, look what the Jews did to the Arabs. So they're not so perfect either. And now, that was 70 years ago. Over the last seven decades, there has been a state of Israel. It's developed a very powerful army. It's been able to influence more governments and generations of Americans and other Western, you know, to, to support Israel. And that's how they did it. They were very, very smart, very, very methodical. Um, and they were idealized. They thoroughly, thoroughly believed that this was the right thing to do. And they cared nothing about the other side. In other words, the Palestinians or the Arabs are just nothing. There's no value to their life. There's no value to their existence. And that's how they did it. That was a good question. <laughs> that was kind of really summed up, summed up, uh, summed up how, we, how we ended up where we are today. Yeah? So um, I grew up in, the, in a Christian Zionist environment, and I was just curious what you found in the state of Israel is like the general perception of the Christian Zionist movement. I know like tourism is very big among, the, like, among um, US Christians going to Israel. Um, I just wasn't sure what how those two movements compare to Well, uh, racism and colonialism and violence, you know, create very strange bedfellows. Uh, if you asked Israelis, I mean, they're happy to get the support, they're happy to get the money, they're happy to bring uh, all these pastors and give them the grand tour and take them on helicopter rides and meet with generals and all this stuff. If you ask them what they thought about Christian Zionists, they'll probably tell you they think they're all nuts. They have no respect for them whatsoever. They want the money, they want the support. But these Israelis are, you know, they're secular people, they're Jews. They could care less about the Christians or what they think or anything like that. They're bringing them the support, they're giving them the money, and that's all they care about. You know? And they're helping with votes here in the United States because they do have political strength. They do have political power here in the US. And 
if, if the word Israel is mentioned, then they're all, they're all over it. If the word Palestine is mentioned, then they're going to kill it. So they have a very good ally here. Um, so they, but, you know, I mean, they'll take an ally, any ally, because that's, that's kind of how they are, you know. Isn't it true that, that there was an expectation that uh, sort of strong Orthodox Judaism would, would die out? Uh, that is, the secular Zionists felt that. But in fact, there's clearly a very strong and you know, very right-wing Orthodox community, that's in, in, certainly in some of the settlements and in Jerusalem. Yeah. So uh, say a little bit about that group. Well, Orthodox Judaism is a very strange animal. It's a very strange phenomenon. Now, in America, you have Orthodox, conservative, and reform movements, three different movements that interpret Judaism differently. In Israel, there's one Judaism, and that's it. It's Orthodox Judaism. Therefore, the other movements, which are a little more religiously, more liberal, really don't have a foothold. They have some, but it's very small. Uh, so when you talk about uh, Judaism within Israel, it's Orthodox Judaism, which means, you know, the long beards and the black clothes and you know, slight variations, but you know, you, you, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I imagine you know the image. Now, within Orth now, when the Zionists began claiming that Jews need to come back, the Orthodox Jews, now, as I said, the, the Zionist Jews were completely secular. They didn't believe in God. They didn't follow the traditions of the law. They didn't care about religion. They wanted nothing to do with religion. They wanted a secular, modern state. But there were very large Orthodox, you know, Jewish Orthodox communities around the world. And they were appalled by the idea of Jews creating a state. Why? Because Jewish law, Jewish law, prohibits Jews from returning to the land of Israel. Jewish law prohibits Jews from claiming sovereignty in the land of Israel. So most people think, what did you just say? Jewish law, so according to Jewish law, and the way most, or the way, you know, Orthodox Jews view this, who follow Jewish law, the Jews were expelled from their homeland because they, they committed terrible sins. And they're not permitted to come back until the day that God sends them a sign and says they're permitted to come back. And this is a completely religious issue. No secular Jew can come back and say, well, OK, it's time to return, and we're going to take it away. Jews are prohibited from violence and from, and from, and from war. They're prohibited from uh, declaring war on other nations. They're prohibited from endangering the life of any human being, Jew or otherwise. And the day that all, you know, all nations come together and, you know, the Jewish version of the Messiah, which is different than Jesus, you know, shows up and God gives us all these signs, then Jews will be permitted to return. So Orthodox Jews are looking at these Zionists and saying, what are they doing? This is heresy. They're not even, they're not Jews, they're her heretics. But what the Zionists did and what the state of Israel did is they started to convince more and more groups within that Orthodox community that it's worth their while to accept the state of Israel. So within that community, you've got lots of different groups, some who are completely reject Israel and refuse to pay taxes and refuse to take money and refuse to serve in the army, and all the way to the other end, which they are happy to serve in the army and they're happy to participate with the state and they're happy to kill, kill Arabs and so on. So you've got that whole range. Um, and if, when you go to pro-Palestinian events here in the U.S., you're always going to see a contingent of these rabbis, you know, the typical Jewish look with Palestinian flags wrapped around them saying, free Palestine, real Jews do not support Israel, which to a lot of people is like a completely twisted, you know, journalists go, what, 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 what are we seeing here? We can't believe what we're looking at here. Um, so you've got, you've got the whole range of Jewish orthodoxy from the ones who still completely reject the state of Israel, with whom I've become very good friends lately, all the way to ones that are completely like zealots, you know, and just you see them in the settlements, you see them in Hebron, you see them in all these different places doing terrible things. 
Yeah. Could you relate uh, a little bit more about how civil liberties are under attack and how this case relates to current erosions of civil liberties? In yeah, the United States. Yeah, if you would. Well, the, the whole case is, it, it, the whole case, I think, shows, the Holy Land Foundation shows that the myth of civil liberties in the United States doesn't exist. I mean, it's a myth unless you're white and privileged. If yeah, you're an so Arab, to a yeah. So if you're so if you're a Native American, if you're black, if you're Latino, if you're an Arab, um, then there's no assumption that you deserve any of those liberties, because you're going to be, and you are, guilty until proven innocent. You know, and of course Donald Trump represents this represents this very well. Um, and, or I should say, he's a, represent, uh, a representation of that. You know, a judge can't be fair because he's a Mexican, and I'm going to. And Trump wants to build a wall, so that's the end of the story. You know, maybe you remember that case. You know, the San Diego judge who happens to be, you know, of Mexican uh, descent. He shouldn't be a judge, and he shouldn't be on the case because he's Mexican. Therefore, he is. You know, he he, he can't be fair. So I mean that's that's the case, but that you know to, to most Americans don't want to hear that, and most and 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 in a lot of cases white privileged Americans don't want to believe that that's the case. You know we created a democracy here. Well, if you create a democracy, then how do you explain the reality of blacks in America? How do you explain what happened to the Native Americans? How do you explain the reality of that Latinos have to live through? How do you explain what is happening to Arabs and Muslims now? So I think that when we say the erosion of li civil liberties, it kind of it kind of uh, portrays this reality as though there were civil liberties. And I think to these communities, communities of color and minorities in this country never had these liberties. You know, when I, when, you know, when I tell the story to, to, to black Americans, they're not surprised. They've lived through it. They've seen the federal government. They've seen their own people political prisoners, accused of murder, accused of terrible crime, serving decades in prison, and they were innocent. You know, same thing with Latinos, same thing with other minorities. So this is a reality that there are no civil liberties unless you're white and privileged in America. And the assumption that everybody enjoys these liberties and they're somehow being eroded now after 9-11, I mean, some are being eroded after 9-11, but to many communities, they never even existed. In other words, these liberties, these rights never existed in America. Um, and it's a wake-up call. And when I talk, I, hear, I see this on the faces of, of you know, white privileged Americans because I was a white privileged Israeli. So I remember the shock I went through when I realized I live in this racist apartheid reality in my homeland where I was born and raised in Jerusalem. I was appalled. You know, I mean, it really messes you up. At one point, you just run away from it and say, no, nah, these guys are all liars. They're terrorists. They're whatever. So everybody, so a lot of people go through that process. So when Americans are presented, and I say white Americans are presented with this case, the, the, re the reaction is usually, yeah, but they must have done something. They must have done something. It can't be that they're completely innocent. They must have done something. Well, show me. And what I did in the book, by design, is I actually put the court documents, the transcripts from the trial, so people can read for themselves. It's not me saying that there was an injustice. Read the transcripts and see for yourself what goes on in a courtroom. It is beyond belief. You know, I read about 30,000 pages of court documents. And it blow, you know, I would have put all of them in the book, but then it would have been you know, a very, very, you know, too, too, big, too big to carry. You, know, you have to read the actual goings on in the courtroom the witnesses, the testimony, the cross-examination to believe how crazy it is, how unjust it is, what an unbelievable, what an egregious in case of injustice this was. And there's no big deal. There's a judge, there's a jury, there are witnesses. Some of these witnesses are, are, are you know, well-credentialed terrorism experts. Like I said, sitting on in think tanks in, in Washington, D.C., advising the president. And you go, this is what they came up with? In a court of law, and then these guys are convicted? Well, there it is. You know, it's not me saying it. Look at it. So the assumption that these, again, that these liberties existed, 
which is also why several of the lawyers were so shocked they wanted to quit the law. The defense lawyers, they just wanted to quit the law. Now, granted, they were all white, privileged Americans, and so they were shocked to see just how unjust the system was and how biased it could be. So there we are. We have a lot of work to do. Well, what you're saying is that just as you had a long journey <coughs> to explore your own history, um, that's what we have in this country. Yeah. And it's a question whether we want to explore it or not, whether yeah. we want to develop the truth. And it doesn't mean you throw everything out, yeah. but it's important to actually try to see the reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're on Queen Anne. It wasn't that many years ago that this was Native American land that Native Americans were, could not buy homes here, African Americans could not buy homes here. I mean, that's just a fact. It's just a fact. And it's important to understand that and know something of our own history. So I think it's a very comparable story. Yeah. yeah. And we have to try to learn from it. It is a comparable story, yeah. And when people talk, people talk about uh, shared values between America and, the, and Israel, the shared values. And I was thinking to myself, what are exactly those shared values? Well, many of these shared values are, you know, not really values, but, 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 uh, but uh, uh, sim symbols of, of racism, you know. But don't be depressed, act. <laughs> the important thing is not, not, to let, not to let this bring us down. The important thing is when we realize something that horrifying, that's shocking, that's wrong, not to be weighed down by it, but to be encouraged to act. You know, everything's changeable. You know, when you think about, look at the reality of blacks in this country, and look where it is today, it wouldn't have happened if people didn't act. I mean, it's far from being where it should be, but, you know, the reality is very different. You know, and it's up to people to act. School shootings, you know, suddenly high school kids are up in arms. Good. That's exactly the right reaction. That's exactly the, you guys should be up in arms. I mean, everybody should be up in arms, all these school shootings. You know, you're up in arms. You have to stand up and demand, you know, demand what you think is your right, demand what you think should be done to fix it. You know, Vietnam War, you know, some of the older here, some of us who are older here remember, you know, Vietnam, South Vietnam, does anybody even know that there was a South Vietnam today? You know, if you look at, most people don't even know that there was a South Vietnam. There was an American president not that long ago who swore that the United States would never forsake its most important ally in Southeast Asia, South Vietnam. A couple of years after that, there was no South Vietnam. It was gone. The war in Vietnam was like a big thing. God knows how many were killed. Vietnamese and American forces, mostly Vietnamese, of course, and other nations in Southeast Asia as a result of this. Today, nobody even knows there was a South Vietnam. There's a Vietnam, you know? And it's interesting because here in America, you don't really quite learn that. In other countries, you learn of the, of the American defeat in Vietnam, which really it was. It was a massive, humiliating military defeat, which was really inevitable in a way when you think about it. But I mean, you know, things change because people demanded. Americans demanded to get out of Vietnam. End of story. And the American president had to do it because he couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't step out of the White House. You know, of course, he was brought down by uh, breaking into the Watergate Hotel, not for war crimes, but, you know, as long as he was brought down. So there are, you know, the option to stand up and change thing is always available, especially in, in, uh, for privileged people. Stand up and make a statement. Stand up and say something. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about South Africa because you have apartheid in South Africa and blacks were not allowed to vote. And then they had the transition, they had uh, public protests, they had sanctions, they had outcry. And in the end, now in South Africa, no matter what the color of your skin, what group you're from, everyone gets a vote. And when you say, I can imagine a future with Palestine, I'm wondering if what you're referring to then is a place where everyone has the right to vote. Not only vote, but the right, yeah, absolutely, the right to, to live free, to have water, to you know, not, not be killed, uh, not be arrested for your, what you think and your opinions, absolutely, yeah. I mean, South Africa is probably the closest equivalent to what's happening in, South, in, in, in Palestine, and 
the call for boycott and divestment and sanctions against Israel is based on the same call which eventually brought down the racist regime in South Africa. The smart thing that the Israelis did, though, you know, in South Africa they called it apartheid, which is a bad name. I mean, it's really a bad name. So you go against apartheid, you go for freedom, that's great. In Israel, it made it now you have to say that you reject Israel. Well, not a lot of people feel comfortable with that. It's kind of biblical. It's kind of nice. It means Jews. We don't want to go against Jews. Maybe it's anti-Semitic. So just, just from that perspective, kind of a PR perspective, it's hard for people to do, you know. But really, that is exactly what it is. Israel is apartheid. Apartheid is Israel. It's the same thing. We need to reject one just like we rejected the other and not look at it in kind of biblical and, you know, emotional uh, terms, but just go after it because it's unjust, yeah. You might not want to go here because it is complicated. It's all complicated. But, uh, people want to know what they're up against. So why does the power structure of the United States give all this money to Israel? Well, that's the $20 million a day question. I think it's because America, the, American, the, the, the political system here allows for lobbies. And so there's a very strong lobby. There are two strong lobbies in America, and they're both equally destructive. The NRA and the Israeli lobby. And they both have total disregard for human life, in my opinion. And they are incredibly powerful. Now, when, when we say lobby, I think a lot of times people imagine a bunch of guys in suits in Washington, D.C., you know, talking to staffers and talking to members of Congress and giving them you know, brown envelopes with cash and stuff like that. That's not what lobbying is. You know, earlier when I talked about high school textbooks and the way they portray the reality in, in Palestine, the reality in the Middle East, um, when you look at the way the media covers it, when you look at the way um, members of small city, you know, members of councils of small cities in America are taken to tours in Israel by this lobby. When you look at the fact that uh, pro-Israeli groups fund police chiefs of American cities to go to do special training in Israel so that they know how to come back here and deal with you know, blacks and terrorists and others here in America. That is how lobbying is done. So you, you take people one at a time by the hand, give them the tour, show them how we deal with terrorism, how, and you know, show them how wonderful we are, and then they come back and they do the rest of the work. So you don't have to teach anybody that Israel is on our side, that Israelis are good and Arabs are bad, because by the time they get to the point where they have to really make, take the vote or make the decision, they're already convinced because they learned it in their textbooks, they heard it in their synagogues, they heard it in their churches. The police chief already knows it. The city council members agree with it. Mayors know it. So obviously it goes up the chain. Uh, the members of uh, state legislature know it. Somebody runs for office, you know, national office, senator, congressman. They're already there. That's how the lobbying is done, and that's what allows this this ongoing power structure. That's why Israel continues to be so strong uh, in America and in American public opinion because they, this is how they do the lobbying. You know, they donate, where was I? I forget where I was. I think in Texas somewhere. They gave, they uh, came in and they presented in, uh, a tolerance course for students in school, in high school. And then they presented the school with a certificate saying it is a uh, tolerant space. But part of that course also teaches that Arabs are terrorists and, ter and, and, and criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic and racist. That's part of the course. So kids know it, the teachers accept it, and it goes on and on and on. That's how lobbying is done. So it's really important to have our you know, radars on and to pay attention to these things. You know, if you go to uh, museums of tolerance, Holocaust museums, are they really museums of tolerance? What do they say about Arabs? What do they show about Palestinians? You know, there's always a little bit that shows that Palestinians are terrorists and suicide bombers and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's how it works. That's how the system in America works. That's why, you know, if we're not, if we're not vigilant, this will take over. And we're all going to be complicit. If, uh, the reality is such that if we don't stand up, we're complicit. And that's tough, but that's, how Amer that's, how, that's the reality in America. Yeah. 
we're just about out of time. The one note I would add um, that, I, that I want to make sure is in here, I mean, even if you just read the final 10 pages of this book, what you'll find out is that these five men um, who, except for one, are American citizens, are also incredibly devout spiritual men. Yeah. I mean, their, their, their Islamic, their Muslim faith is so Should I read that last part real quick? Yeah, I think there's just like two pages. I think that would be, yeah. It's not even two pages. I'll read you, I'll read, since, you know, the end of the story is obvious, by reading the last, the end of the book, I'm not really, you know, giving you the end of the story. It's, it's not like really a spoiler, yeah. But it's interesting. Because, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot in this book is the prison system. And how do, you, how do you sit in prison for all these years knowing you're innocent and not lose your mind? I was in jail one night. You know, I get arrested when I'm, by the Israeli soldiers a lot during protests, and you know, one night I spent in jail, I thought I was going to lose my mind. The sense of being totally powerless and not knowing if it's day or night, and, I mean, it's just horror, and being with criminals all around you, right? So how do these guys manage? And, and spirituality is how they do it. And one of them just described it to me, and I'll, I'll finish with this little, little part in the book. <clears throat> so this is one of these guys telling me this. He says, knowing and fully believing that the, uh, that the Quran we have in our hands today is the exact Arabic text that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad by God is moving beyond words, Ghassan explained to me. He said, the Quran is full of verses that were relieved, uh, revealed in order to bring comfort and hope to the Prophet Muhammad and his companions during their time of hardship. Among these stories is that of Moses and his trials in leading the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and the story of David facing Goliath in his ultimate victory, all of which press upon the believers that with the help of God Almighty, justice will prevail. These were stories that were familiar to me as well from the Jewish tradition. It struck me that as Israelis, we like to see ourselves as the descendants of Moses and David, yet it's all too clear today that we are more like the Pharaoh and Goliath. As Ghassan said to me, what my friends and I did at the Holy Land Foundation was to help Palestinians who are suffering. They are victims because they find themselves living under a brutal racist regime that practices apartheid. To be persecuted for such, a no, for such noble work is exactly what the prophets had faced at their time. And being reminded of this is how I get through it. Indeed, their faith has made them unenslavable. And quite frankly, what's really amazing about these guys is that they're all free. When you meet with them and when you talk to them, they're not in prison. They're all free. So that's pretty incredible. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot.